Hey everybody, my name is Jeff Bull, Manager of Developer Advocacy. And my name is Hugo Ladapi. I'm a Principal re uh, Researcher in Cisco Research, uh, ETNI, Emerging Technologies and in Incubation. Hugo, it's great to have you here. Uh, Thank you so much. My first time overseas, so my first time at Cisco Live in EMEA, which is really cool. Exciting. Um, <laughs> it is. And you know, as uh, walking around today and kind of getting this first day at the event, getting to see all the different technologies, um, what's interesting to me is we don't like, I didn't notice, I didn't notice anywhere like a big zone that's like our AI zone or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. I, the reason I say that, half serious and half joking is everyone's seeing chat GPT. Yeah. It's everywhere, it's getting talked about. And I'm gonna be honest, I've written, I, I should say, I, I, I haven't written full three blog posts off of it, but I have used it several times, and we were talking pre-show that like, it is surprising how good it is at coming yeah. up with wording. Yeah. I will tell anybody who watches, I haven't like written, used it, and then taken it verbatim. That wouldn't be smart. What I do is you use it as a way to get you some motivation, like, oh, I hadn't thought to use those words. Okay, thank you, and I can move things around. But I wanted to kind of give you an opportunity, since you spend a lot of time in research thinking yeah. about artificial intelligence and ML and the things that come along with that. I'd love to hear, you know, the chat GD, GPT thing as a start, like a seed, but yeah. what are you working, your group working on research-wise around AI? What right. is it, what's the landscape of that look like for us? Right. Uh, so it's a, it's a very broad landscape from uh, from quantum to how does it apply to security to how do you, uh, you know, do uh, knowledge representation. So, so, but with regards to chat GPT, we're actually looking, we have a lot of focus efforts across the company right now where we try to understand how does this fantastic new technology fit into you know, a, a Cisco branding and Cisco products where you can trust it. As you probably, when you were playing with it, I'm sure you realized and you notice, as you said, you have to filter the output, right? Yes, 100%. And, yeah, and that, that goes back to uh, what, if, what, you know, what are the core limitations and why is it that ChatGPT is both good and, and, and what's the problem? And, and what we notice is that it's, uh, it's essentially if you go back to trust, what is the definition of trust, right? So trust is that you have a firm belief in the uh, reliability, the truth, or uh, the ability of someone or something, mm -hmm. right? And in that, if you, if you put that into the question as would you trust chat GPT, you probably wouldn't trust it, right? The data that, you know, it makes a lot of mistakes and all that sort of thing. And so then the question is why why is it have these problems? You know, how do you? Is it easy to fix? And now we all know uh, with people and systems that we interact with, uh, you know, it's not always easy to if you can't trust something to just fix it retroactively, right? Once once you have a trust issue, uh, you typically it's not that easy to find some way to whether it's a system or a person or whatever it is, right? Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about what the, the source of that uh, trust problem is, and it goes back to the way that uh, all of these machine learning and deep learning systems are are trained. And go, uh, uh, one of the best uh, statisticians in the world, uh, George Box, he talked. To, uh, he, had, he had a saying that he said, uh, "All models are wrong, but some are useful." Right? And it's a really important thing to kind of uh, to kind of keep in mind. And so, one way to understand this is okay. Okay, the way that these these uh, deep learning, machine learning systems are are, are trained. And I'm going to ask you to help me with this. Okay? Uh, imagine that you are, you know, a, an AI. And you're going, to, you're going to learn about object detection. It could, we'll also, language is the same thing. And, and so you know nothing, but, you, but you're smart. You can you know, recognize patterns. Okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to train it just like I do with any other deep learning system. And I'm going to present you, you know nothing, I'm going to present you with like hundreds of thousands of just random images of objects with like maybe a little uh, square around the object and then a label that says that's a dog. You know? So that's how you're going to learn about what a dog is. You know, you, you, you don't know that a dog makes sounds or that it's fuzzy, what it feels like, or any other movie, you know, there's no temporal information, mm -hmm. okay? So you're just presented with all these images. Would, what kind of an understanding do you think you would have of what a dog actually is? I mean, superficial at best. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It would be, and, and so similarly with language in ChatGPT, the way that it's trained is it's given billions and billions of uh, you know, sentences and texts from all the world, and it said, okay, just predict the next word or the next two words or the next three words. And so it gets a very superficial ability to predict the words that are likely yeah. based on what you put in, but it's a very superficial understanding, right? Yeah. And that's kind of the, the so that's, that kind of boils down into the, the core nature of the problem, which is you have this model and it has these very superficial relationships. Like when you were learning dog, if all the, all the images I gave you happened to be in a park with dogs in parks, you might well think that, well, Maybe it's the grass that's part of what a dog is. So if I see green, that's a dog. 
And that's actually the first deep learning systems uh, that were very famous because they were uh, uh, thought to, to detect tanks, for example. But all they were detecting was like sand and, or versus you know, jungle, mm -hmm. you know, green versus brown, right? So, so uh, how do you address that problem? So I'm gonna ask you again to, to just kind of recall when you were a little kid and uh, your mom taught you, say, what a car is. Okay, so if you can go back, you're two years, I don't know, one year old maybe when you learned the word car. How, how, did, that, how did that work for you? When, when you uh, so your mom said, that's a car. Did she really teach you what a car is by pointing at it and saying yeah. car? So how did, how did that work? I, you, then immediately you say, that's a car, and then when someone sees a truck, yeah. you're like, well, that's not a car. Yeah, but did you also, as a kid, you went inside of cars, right, yeah. already, you know, since you were a baby. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you know that they, they kind of rolled around. You knew they go vroom, vroom, right? Mm -hmm. You knew a lot about cars before anyone told you, hey, the, the label car, right? Okay, yeah. So we're building systems that kind of do, that do that approach, which is they, they learn like a kid would do and say, okay, here are the, you know, the patterns. I'm, I'm learning on my own, you know, so self-supervised learning with the objective of, quote, unquote, making sense. Making sense is a very interesting thing. When the kid says onomatopoeia and they say, like, vroom, vroom, that's making, in a sense, that's literally, they're, they have an idea of what a car is, and they're making that making sense by actually making the sound of what that does. What you, the way you're describing it to me, it, to say it a little bit differently, and you tell me if I'm off base on this or not, it sounds like what you're describing is essentially we are teaching them, you're trying to train it by context rather than data points. So it's yes. like what you're learning is, what the system can learn then, it is yes. contextual awareness of yes. a thing rather than here are four key, here's, the car looks like this, like this, because it can easily lead. And you know, thinking about it like that also brings to mind a lot of the, the un, unintended side effects, hopefully unintended side effects, where there's things like, you know, if you're talking about people, and the yeah. human side of uh, yeah. AI training, ML training, or data, data training, is it's really easy to unintentionally train a data set to be biased towards certain attributes, exactly. whatever those are. Exactly. Whether it's an unintended consequence or not, it's really easy because, yeah. uh, because if you lack the context, yes. and there's so much nuance in human-based yes. context, it's really easy for that to go to a place that would not be po a positive impact for a group of people. That's a great point. And that's actually one of the things that really excites us is when you get deeper understanding of what's happening, you know, why, of all you know, the behaviors and the, the events that are happening, the, the, you know, the objects that are in that, what predicts events, when you, just as any human or any animal really does, right? Then you, know, you're, you're, you have a better bias towards truth, in a mm -hmm. sense, because it's just what's happening. You know, the, what you're biased towards is learning what predicts what's going to actually happen with semantics that are kind of multimodal, you know, so you have not just the time domain, you know, you're seeing things evolve, but you're seeing, uh, you know, sound, you're hearing sounds, you're, you know, you got visual input. In networking, you could have telemetry, security, you're bringing all that together. And so now you have a much deeper under, uh, basis for AI that's going to, that you can trust, you yeah. know, so it'll be, and that's, the, and the other elements that we're working on with Cisco Research on, just regards to this tiny, Cisco Research is big, we do a lot more, and ET&I, and my department, you know, actually we have a couple great products out here, uh, Callisti and Panoptica, you know, we're all about kind of uh, a new approach to incubating our own businesses, new, new lines of businesses, mm -hmm. but with regards to the AI, the small piece of the world, I have, uh, we're working with a lot of universities right now. Oh, okay. So, you know, universities are bringing new uh, learning by reasoning technologies, new things, new ways of, uh, you know, representing knowledge in, in, uh, in ways that it's, it's more, uh, it's not as brittle, you know, as what we've seen so right. far. Um, so many, many different kinds of projects, you know, that, that we're bringing. This is everything from hyperdimensional computing to things called, like, it's, it's neuro-symbolic is our approach. The current um, AI that you see is all what we would call sub-symbolic statistical models, right? And we think that you have to bring in symbolic model, causal reasoning, you know, uh, and, and other kinds of reasoning, and then you have to integrate these things tightly. And that's that kind of what sense. we're calling hybrid AI, and we have actually a very cool project, uh, uh, Deep Vision, that we'll be uh, releasing soon, and there's a lot of other work that we've done where we've applied this AI that I'm mentioning to mm -hmm. you, uh, to uh, networking projects, security, you know, uh, and uh, video analytics, uh, and we think it's going to it's going to be kind of revolutionary across the board. That is, you know, it's there's probably so much more we could talk about. Um, but the thing that just struck me and what you and you said about bringing those two different um, ways of uh, like viewing the data that's out there. I, for a network engineer, this has been like 
the classic problem that like as a network engineer we've dealt with forever is I've got all these tools and feeds of data telling me errors or things, events that are happening, yeah. and wouldn't it be great if some tool could say, based off of these four or five streams of data that are coming in, very likely the actual problem here is yes, this. Yes. And even if it's, as we talked about in the beginning with Jet, Chat GPT, even if it isn't 100% reliable that that is the, actually the answer, if it gets you a head start in the direction yeah. you need to go look, yeah. yes, efficacy of data and all that needs to be, has to get where it has to get, but if it can give you a head start to where you yeah. need to go, like the mean time to remediation yes. for network engineers or anybody else really, yeah. improving that, that alone would have, would I think open the door to more and more businesses and companies and individuals finding their inspiration to do re really interesting creative things out there. Oh, yeah. But yeah. we, I think even in the last five, 10 years, we've seen with more DevNet and other things where, yeah. where us along with a lot of others are inspiring people to build and learn and develop, because we're still stuck in this mean time to resolution type model, it still hinders thought creativity amongst yeah. people to really go solve interesting problems because we're still kind of stuck. You just hit my like my favorite use case. So we actually we didn't do it on four streams. We uh, like a typical, as you know, uh, enterprise network environment. Mm -hmm. You're looking at hundreds of thousands. And that's another thing I should mention is that this actually was able to do real time processing with minimal resources on 300,000 time time series, right? Of all that telemetry data, everything from you know the NetFlow stuff to the temperature of power supplies and everything, and it brought it all together, and it was able to kind of detect events, kind of like the way if you were a kid and those were your sensors, you'd say, you know. If uh, 100 of these events all change like from one way of being to another way of being at the same time, I don't know exactly what happened, but it looked like something happened. And then after that you say, you see that, well then that, every time those 100 time series, whatever the names were, mm -hmm. they all have that event at the same time, then something big happens and the network goes down, right? And so you can begin to build predictive models. So it's yep. really an exciting area. It's you know, Yeah, I think uh, it, it would be great to have follow-ups with you. We'll, we'll dive in. I, I don't know how much time we have left, but... Uh, yeah, I would yeah. I would absolutely love to, but I, th I do think we have to wrap. Um, I would love to spend some more time with you, though, and maybe dive into these conversations a little bit further. So let's exactly. let's pick a time to do that. I'm sure the audience would absolutely love that. So we'll, we'll look. Everyone, look. You're hearing it here. We're Looking forward to we'll, talking to we'll, you. We'll, we'll tease some additional videos that will come in the future. Hugo, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so um, much. Is there anything you want to leave the audience with before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, so keep an eye out for this uh, Cisco Deep Vision. Uh, go to the Cisco Research uh, website, you know, and see all the re research we have across quantum and uh, security and everything else. And uh, look for our ET and I products, Callisti and uh, Panoptica. You know, so so uh, a lot of exciting developments. You know, applying the zone to win methodology in action at Cisco. Excellent. Thank you so much, Hugo. Thank really you. Appreciate it. And for everybody watching, go to developer.cisco.com/slash/cisco live for more information and more content for the event.